everyone, my name is Eleanor and welcome to your Medieval Winter Vegetable Garden Part 2. So this is in follow-up to Part 1 that's available on the Ontario YouTube channel. In Part 1 we go over the planning process of it, so where to situate it, how to do container winter vegetable gardening, what uh, varietals and types to look for for your medieval winter vegetables, how to kind of keep that steady pulse of nutrition coming out of your garden um, to help with uh, food production in these times. Um, in this one, what we're going to do is we're going to go over kind of three different aspects. We're going to take a quick snapshot of what is actually going on in my medieval winter vegetable garden currently here in July. And whereas I'm sad that we can't do this face to face at Ontario West War, it's actually this beautiful time that I can invite you in and uh, show you what is going on through the video in my garden right now. So we're going to take a quick snapshot of that. Um, and then we're going to tips and tricks on how to make the most space out of the space and time that is often a limiting factor for our gardens. And especially here in July when our tomatoes are just starting to get their first blushes and our pepper plants are starting to produce. Um, it's sometimes difficult to think about, okay, for winter we're going to need to put kales in the ground and where do I put this kale? Because everything is already full up with tomatoes and peppers and squashes and zucchinis and things like that. So some tips on how to uh, stage things to get the best production going for that. And then we're going to go and look over some uh, winter perennial types of vegetables. And so whereas this isn't going to be something maybe to look for this year to get started, it is something to keep in mind if you continue on with your winter vegetable gardening in subsequent years. And that is where we will uh, talk about skirt. So anyway, uh, without further ado, welcome to my garden. Um, this is a 3 by 20 foot bed that's up against the side of my garage, which makes it really handy for winter gardening because I can just sneak out of this door in, uh, <laughs> even when it's dark and come out here and grab a handful of parsley, some kales, some leeks, whatever's going on, and I can toss it into my uh, stews for that evening. So access is key. It makes it so much easier. Um, so with that, I'm going to change up video settings and I'll take you on a quick tour here. So. All right, so this is looking at the bed. You can tell a better chance now to see that it's 3 by 20. I have some things that live here year round. I have a pomegranate in the corner that I'm trying to get enough heat to so it maybe someday will produce fruit. I also have what I call my perpetual parsley patch underneath the um, pomegranate there on the right hand side. And then these green and white plants that is the cosmic kale or the Dobbin short kale, which is a super medieval early type. Um, of kale. And then in the corner there next to the pile of wood I have uh, new to me this year is a, a jersey type of kale or a walking stick kind of kale. Um, I also, thanks to the power of Attila, I have a little potting area over here and then I can start my baby plants and it's nice and protected from the rain. And then I also tend to keep a patch of sorrel here to help feed out with chickens during the winter, give them some extra nutrition. And it's a nice little plant nursery where I can focus on my starts getting going here. We have some of my Groninger kales, some cabbages, oka, and more kale. <laughs> it's always more kale. Um, some of these beds are a little bit messy, but I also here next to the calendula, this is what's left of my Alexander's for the year. Um, Alexander's do not like the heat, so they kind of have this winter dormancy period, but they'll flush up and I got them to produce seed one year and now thankfully they are self-seeding and they keep coming back as volunteers, sometimes a little too much. So you can notice that these spaces here where I currently have my tomatoes, eventually that's where my spinach is going to go. I'm going to start my spinach here actually probably after we're done videotaping and uh, get those growing and then in about a month or so put them in the ground. This year I am going to focus on some of the more robust spinach varietal types like my Amsterdam or the Virafle just because I want to ensure success this year. You can also tell on the right hand side there's my the rest of my pot nursery. I had some pepper plants that were starting to do really poorly so I pulled them out and put them in pots. Oh, that's a lot of peas. And then there's also my grand fennel experiment. Um, so, 
I also have some pot marigolds growing here. Again, this is uh, the resinosa type of calendula. It has a nice resiny for salves. It also produces this bright yellow flower and typically produces flowers throughout the winter, which adds a nice little pop of color and happiness to the garden. But also it makes way very easily for spinach and other types of winter greens that I choose to add to my garden. This one I just let itself seed. You can see here there's some seeds growing and I just let them scatter to the ground and survival of the fittest. I also do that similar technique here for what I call my perpetual parsley patch and so I started with like six or seven uh, plants about five years ago and then what I do is I just allow one or two of them to go to seed and so you can see these flowers right here that the pollinators are just adoring right now. And then I let the seeds just kind of scatter to the floor. And then eventually they'll produce little babies. And so some of them will germinate and then I thin them out. But this is a kind of a fun way that year after year I don't really have to start parsley seeds. Um, I can just let it go on automatic pilot for the most part. I did start some seeds this year just because um, I wanted to make sure to have enough. So. And then over here, I have what is left for the season of my primroses. Primroses are a fun little perennial that you can add to your garden. Punch of little uh, color in the spring when they start to flower and they're also edible. If you are looking to add primroses to your garden, tuck them in the corner in the shade so they'll be um, happier. And then also in the garden centers, look for the white or the yellows that have very simple flowers. Try to avoid the more vibrant colors of the really bright oranges and purples and pinks. They tend not to perennialize but very well. And the white ones are a little bit more true to the medieval primrose. And then of course, what is a veggie garden without da -da, the house leek? So it's starting to go to flower right now. Um, but yeah, so my little homage to the house leek, which is very common. All right, as I mentioned when we were looking at the parsley patch, that this year I started some parsley seedlings to kind of help supplement that. I want to make sure they have plenty of parsley this year. So these are my baby parsleys. Um, they take a really long time to get going, like most of our winter vegetables. Uh, slow, steady growth is what they're keyed to do. And so getting them in the ground early, or getting them seeded early is key. Um, so if you were kind of past the window for a lot of these to start seeding them, spinach is still really good and there's a few others that here in July we can seed. I'm actually gonna seed up my spinach um, later on today. Uh, but the garden center store should start um, being able to sell the baby starts like this. So um, other things is these are my leeks. So again, I started these a couple of months ago and now they're getting out of size and they're ready to plant up. I do them in big trays like this just because I can just take out one of the plugs, stick it in the ground and be done with it. There's other techniques where you plant individual leeks. So it's really whatever works for you. This is kind of a... Uh, taken from Elliot Coleman, who does a lot of winter gardening in Maine, and he does a similar technique like this. And I found it's really helpful and it does save time. And then otherwise, um, my baby kales are re getting ready to go in the ground. This is that Dazzle Blue, which is a modern varietal, but I just adore it. And then also this is my Groninger, a Groninger kale which has that beautiful, very medieval purple venation. And if you can see it, I don't know if it will show on the camera, but the stems hike are furry. And so there's a lot of traits that it has that kind of throw it back to that more medieval type of kale, which is really fun. And so this is the one that they think can be documented to like uh, 1200s or maybe 1300s Holland or 14s. Yeah. So whether or not that holds true. Uh, these guys are going in the ground today because uh, they're a little bit past prime. You can tell by their root structure here, they're starting to get a little bit root bound. So they totally need to either go in the ground or they need to go into a bigger pot. Uh, so that'll be something I'm taking care of today. But that leads us to the next section of how do we sneak these little guys into the garden beds when they're already chocked full of tomatoes and peppers. So come into the other part of the garden. 
So this is one of my main tips and tricks that I do for finding space in my winter garden is I plant things in between other ones. <laughs> so what does that mean? Uh, it's sometimes called intercropping or successional planting, all of these kind of things are terms people use interchangeably sometimes for these. Uh, so I have planted my kale, which are these little baby ones, right, here next to my tomatillos, which are these big ones in cages. and the tomatillos are going to get huge and take over this bed and my baby kales are going to hide out here in the shade of the tomatillos and be quite content and then come fall when the tomatillos have played out and are all done then um, they get cut not ripped out but cut so you don't want to destroy this um, disturb the soil structure and then the baby kales are going to be root well rooted and ready to roll and so this is one of my favorite techniques to kind of sneak some of your winter vegetables into your summer beds there are also different family types right so we have our cabbages or our brassicaceae next to our um, pepper tomato plants our solanaceae so there's not a whole lot of um, disease transfer that we need to worry about with that either all right, so here is another bed is showing that same kind of technique of getting one plant started while another crop is finishing up. The things that are kind of flopped over, that is my arugula leftover from, it produced really strongly from February through April. And by April, it was starting to play out a little bit. And at that point in time, it, my uh, truncuta kales were ready to go in the ground. And so these are my truncuta kales. I just adore them. They are a great heat loving uh, plant and so they'll do very, very well here. Uh, but they also don't mind the shade. And so while my arugula was going really strong, I planted these in between the rows of arugula and uh, they just kind of snu snuggled into the ground. Their roots got well established and they're ready to rock here now come the summer. And they'll also do really well in these beds through the winter as well. So a fun little thing. And then I just kind of find space as I can and which is what I did with my leeks over here and why I, I have leeks with my cabbages. Um, so I planted these in um, March, I believe, and they're just kind of trundling along. I'm gonna start harvesting. I'm gonna harvest every other one that will give my leeks some more time to grow. These are not my winter leeks, these are summer leeks. So you can tell they're a little bit more luscious. Um, they don't have that really dense cell structure that winter leeks tend to have. All right, so this doesn't look medieval at all. <laughs> this is all very modern techie stuff. Um, but use shade cloth. Uh, you know, you can use the shade of other plants like what we were doing with the tomatillos and the arugula, or you can actually uh, cover your beds with shade cloth. And I did this for my parsnips. Let me open it up here and we can sneak in. Whoops. And you can tell that the parsnips are doing very well. I don't start my parsnips from seed. I never have much uh, success with that, especially the more heirloom types because they can take like anywhere from two to four weeks to germinate. And I just don't have the time <laughs> or the attention to make sure that the seeds are staying moist and hydrated. So I start my parsnips indoors and then I plant them out when they have the first true leaf. And the first true leaves are gonna look like these little serrated edges, kind of almost like a baby strawberry leaf. Um, and the small linear leaves that you see at the base there, those are going to be the cotyledons or the seed leaves. So once they get one leaf on it, they go into the garden and they do pretty well. Sometimes they get some distorted roots, but for the most part, that is well worth <laughs> the price of not having to babysit a parsnip patch through its germination phase. And it's doing very well here tucked in the shade cloth. Speaking of shade cloth, um, that leads us into the perennial vegetables. And another aspect that I use shade cloth for is my skirret. So skirret loves shady, wet soils. It's, you know, um, geared to growing on those moist river banks underneath the tree canopies. And so it starts to get pretty grumpy here in the summer, even in Oregon. Um, so I give it a little bit of shade cloth. It's growing really tall this year. It is um, <laughs> going to be probably almost five feet tall. So I've only put shade cloth over the south side of these hoops and that allows the skirt to grow up and through and do its wonderful thing of producing lots of fun, fun flowers for the pollinator. And then deep down in here, we have our baby or our skirts developing. 
and that is what the base of a skirt looks like. And so throughout all of this, they are taking all of these carbohydrates that they are producing in their top leaves and putting it into the ground, into their uh, storage structures. And that is what we are going to eat and harvest starting in about November when they start to die back through spring when they start to show, um, shoot up. All right, so skirt. Yay! Um, that leads us into the next topic of perennial vegetables. Um, and there are kind of, in my mind, two types of perennial vegetables to add to your garden. It's those that can survive winters and come back strong in the spring. And then there's those that can produce food for you through the winter from your garden. And so scared is one of those that can produce, so long as you can dig the soil uh, and <laughs> the soil's not frozen, you can, you know, pull out food and nutrition throughout the winter. You're not going to get into like the hunger gap kind of phase of this lull as we're waiting for the soils to warm up. Which um, other ones that do produce food uh, through the winter are some of your greens like sorrel and then also cardoons. So let's go take a quick look at those. All right, so cardoons. These things are huge and massive. This one is probably about seven feet tall and it is growing strong. I don't know the varietal type. I just inherited this one from a friend. There are some medieval, uh, where there are some varietals still like uh, the hunchback that has this kind of curved form that um, is documentable. There's some a Dutch painting that has a beautiful example of it from the late 1500s. So uh, cardoons are out there. They're a great one to plant at the back of your garden if you have this space for it. These things are ridiculously large. So make sure you have the space and then uh, just let it do its thing during the year. Let it go to flower. The bumblebees will just adore you for it. And then come winter, you can sneak in underneath here and harvest the stalks. So, so uh, the cardoons, um, we're not going to eat the top parts like the flowers like you do with artichokes. What we are eating is the stems down here. And you can tell, if we zoom in to the growth of the stem here, there's that baby light green one in the center of the screen. That is what's gonna grow up and over the course of the summer and create what we would harvest in the winter. And then it's the stalks that you're harvesting. And then there's lots of tips and tricks online about how to blanch and utilize them. Um, very common is to blanch them, um, flour and fry them because who doesn't like fried carbs? Num. All right, so this is my medieval greens bed and there are some in here that do produce food through the winter and then there's others that grow dormant and don't come back until the spring. Sorrel over here, which apparently my slugs love to eat, um, is one that does produce green throughout the winter. It also has a lot of vitamin C in it. It's high in oxalic acid, but it is a good one to add into soups and kind of helps brighten things up with this nice lemony flavor. I have another one of my perennial kales here. This is the, again, the uh, cosmic kale. You can see I do have a patch of Alexanders, but they're about played out for the year. They're going into their win winter dormancy. Sea kale. Um, this produces, um, this does go into a winter dormancy period and so um, it'll die back to the ground and you won't start getting harvestable, harvestable greens until like March out of it. Salad brunette, this tends to stay green throughout the winter. It's not something that I enjoy eating a whole lot of but it does add a nice little spark of kind of a cucumber brightness to salads. And then this is Good King Henry. <laughs> um, and this one kind of dies back in the winter. There's not a strong production. It is usually one of the earlier ones to start um, greening up in the spring. So that's kind of a fun one to add. I have some clary sage here, which also dies back. It comes up early in the spring, but it's not a really strong producer. And then this is what's left of kind of a more medieval chard type for the year. This one is called perpetual beet or, um, no, perpetual chard or perennial spinach. Um, it is kind of indicative of a very earlier medieval type of chard with this kind of, you can tell that it's not, hasn't been selected for those really strong midribs like modern varietals of chard is. This one's going to flower right now. I'm gonna take off the seed, uh, seed heads and hopefully it will produce some little side shoots here and keep going through the winter. And uh, so this one does produce food crops throughout the winter. 
All right, so I think that's about all that I have to share about uh, medieval winter vegetable gardening here in July. Um, again, it's kind of counterintuitive to think about your winter gardening in July, but this is now the window to try to hit and make. So either get those seeds started or contact your local garden nursery center and ask them to see what kind of varietals they're gonna be getting in. Also remember to situate your garden in a place that's easy to get to, to tend to, and consider planting some of these uh, perennial vegetables that produce throughout the winter. Well, it's raining, I gotta go. Um, hope all is well, take care, stay safe, and um, get some dirt underneath your fingernails. Okay, bye.